30 years, and then uh, started an electronics company to build uh, measuring equipment, uh, uh, low cost measuring equipment, oscilloscope signal generators, that kind of thing, so along the way. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that, that uh, we do a lot of is uh, interfacing to microprocessors. And I thought this group might be interested in, in this particular angle of things. Uh, assembly language programming on Atmel microprocessors uh, using the Linux uh, operating system. So some of you uh, have seen this. This is an Arduino uh, microprocessor board available from Creatron on College Street for a remarkably small amount of money, 20 or 30 bucks. Uh, and it includes a microprocessor and all the interfaces you need to plug it into a computer. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to be able to program these things. I use Linux at home and I like programming and assembler, so I went through the uh, steps of figuring out exactly how to do this. All right. So this is, these are the gizmos. Uh, this is the processor board itself, which can be standalone with a power supply, or you can have uh, a USB connection to a host computer, and you can have this doing some sort of uh, uh, <coughs> electronic uh, high frequency task for you while it's being supervised and communicating with the host. All this via the USB connection. And then this is the programmer for it that plugs into the uh, host computer We're using a USB cable. So when you want to load a new program in, you plug this into the Arduino board, you plug this into the uh, computer and you run the appropriate software and you can program a new program into the, into the hardware and then you unplug. Uh, this is flash uh, memory so it stays there even though the power is cycled on and off. And uh, you have a completely independent operating piece of uh, computing machinery for about 30 bucks. The programmers, these programmers used to cost a fortune, uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, they've come down a lot. This one, uh, you can make it yourself. Uh, there are instructions on the web. This is an AVR RISP2, which is about 39 bucks on eBay. Okay, so th this is all you need for programming, plus some software, which I'll talk about now. So first of all, why act now? This is kind of a religious issue among electrical engineers. Well, they like ARM processors or Motorola, whatever. Why, why this particular processor? Uh, it's a good bet for hobbyists and, and people who are getting into this for a number of reasons. Huge number of parts available from tiny little processors to big ones, very fast ones. Excellent uh, feature set, all kinds of peripherals built into this, timers, uh, DMA, uh, A to D converters, D to A converters, on and on and on. All built into this one little chip for about eight bucks, uh, the chip itself. Uh, readily available, very inexpensive, huge number of uh, supporting parts for it. The, the Arduino uh, people have what they call shields that plug into this, which are interface boards for various bits of hardware. So if you want to drive a stepper motor, for example, you buy the stepping motor shield, plug it into here, write your software, and now you have a, a stepping motor controller uh, for a very low uh, cost. Um, the, the, the one I've got here, for example, is in the dual inline package, which means you can plug it into a protoboard. So we're plug it into a protoboard with a crystal, and you essentially have an operating system. And as I mentioned, the inexpensive development tools and a pretty clean uh, regular architecture, unlike, say, uh, the PIC microprocessor. Anybody use the PIC? <laughs> right. Uh, bank switching registers, and yeah, it's, it's pretty ugly. This one doesn't do that kind of thing. It's pretty nice. Uh, just to show you the, the, the kind of thing this is capable of, the high end uh, X Mega processor in this line is what we use in this particular product. Um, and it actually is a full featured uh, two channel oscilloscope with a signal generator, uh, digital IO, a whole bunch of stuff. And this uh, samples at uh, uh, 40 uh, mega samples uh, per second using an external. Oh, sorry, this, this one is the mini, and it uses the X mega, and uh, it samples at 2 mega samples per second. So it's a 2 mega sample oscilloscope, totally based on one single Atmel processor. So very, very capable devices. Um, and, oh, <laughs> this didn't work. All right. Okay, so let me, um, let me 
talk about the uh, the memory map on this just just for a minute or two, just so you know what the memory is like on this. There are three sections of memory. There's a flash memory. It's a Harvard architecture. First of all, if you're familiar with that term, Harvard architecture is an architecture where the code itself is in one separate memory, the data is in a different memory. Okay, so they're separate. A von Neumann architecture, they're all in the same memory together. So this is a Harvard architecture, which means the instruction length can be different than the data word length. In this case, instructions are 16 bits, data is 8. So uh, the data memory is RAM, and it's volatile. Shut the power off, you lose that. The program is in flash, and it's maintained through a power reset. Okay. Then there's a third type of memory, EEPROM, where you can write things like uh, constants of various kinds, uh, calibration constants, and that kind of thing. Okay, and that can be erased uh, by the program and rewritten. So why write an assembly language? All you, anybody here write an assembly language? You're all C language. Yeah. Huh? Okay, six. we have it. Okay, <laughs> very good. <laughs> I thought it'd be a long of this as an electrical engineer. This is what assembly language looks like and C looks like on this particular processor. And, and as you can see, there's not a hell of a lot of difference, right? You still have to tell a thing, you know, put these bits in this particular register. And in fact, I do it slightly differently. I create a, a binary number with bits ones and zeros in the, where the various flags are supposed to be and then store that in the register. So I can see clearly what's what's going on. But as you can see, there's not a hell of a lot of difference between these two. So when you're writing code that does this kind of thing, C language is not a huge advantage. It doesn't save you a huge amount of work. All right? Again, somewhat of a religious issue, and uh, I don't mean to this. So uh, that's, here's this point. For small programs acting as a hardware replacement, not much difference between a single language and C. A better approach when we're teaching microprocessor hardware. And I taught a course uh, many years ago, and one year we decided, well, let's teach it in C, because C is the up-and-coming thing for microprocessors. And the following year, all these students were doing projects, and they were having a, a very difficult time debugging their microprocessor projects because they didn't understand the underlying hardware well enough. So from that experience, we learned that it's much better when you're starting students in learning uh, microprocessors to start them in assembly. And they can graduate to C later on once they understand what's going on. Um, that's that point. Uh, code timing issues, you can actually see the number of cycles that it's gonna take for a particular loop to operate and and that's not obvious from the C code. Simpler programming environment, uh, which is important to me because uh, you know I'm somewhat deterred by the GCC environment with its compilers, libraries, assemblers, linkers, and all that stuff, and getting all that stuff to work. This is a very simple programming environment, as you'll see in a minute. Peter, the risk of betraying my ignorance on something. Part of the hard libraries is to not have to replicate code because there's always a certain known set of things you can call upon. Yeah. How do you deal with that in assembly? Well, you can create your own libraries if you want, and then you know what's in them. The, the problem is if you use somebody else's libraries, you're trusting them that they it does exactly what you expect it to do in the hardware. Yeah. And, and that said, I mean, an awful lot of Arduino programming is done in the C language using existing libraries, which speeds things up for people. But in my case, I want to understand exactly what's going on. So at the very least, I want to see the assembly language code in the library, be able to look at it. Yeah. So I know you said it's religious. Uh, I want to add a caveat to what you said. This works only when you are using either microcontrollers or simple microprocessors. Right. The moment you go on to you know the S S S or anything like that, especially when the CPU is starting to do funny things. Yeah. Um, it might be a better idea to start with C. Yeah, there are many reasons not to use assembler. I mean, one of them is if, if your code is going to have to move to a different uh, product, for example, or, you know, a different vendor, you know, your code is totally non portable. Mind you, the, you know, C doesn't protect you from things like register assignments and so on. You have to go through and do all that over again. 
So that's, that's one problem. The other problem is if you're writing something complicated like a linked list manipulator, you, would, you, know, you could do it in assembler, but it would be a nightmare. So that's the kind of thing you would want to write in C language. So it, it, you, know, you have to pick the right tool for the job. Okay, all right. So the development process, the very simple development process for this microprocessor, first of all, write the, write the program using a text editor. I use the Joe editor machine, and then you assemble it using the two assemblers that will produce code for the Atmel microprocessors, Avra and GAVA some, and that produces what's called a hex file, which is just simply a list of bytes, and that is uh, the, the assembly language code, which is sort of, which is human readable, is changed into a series of hexadecimal numbers, which is not human readable but which can be loaded into the processor. So that gets loaded into the processor using another program, ABR Dude, and the programming dongle that I showed you um, a minute ago. All right, so you use those two, and it loads into the hardware, takes it about a second and a half, and then you run the program. Well, of course your program doesn't work, right? So now what? Uh, you have to debug it. And the, the technique I tend to use is a serial monitor debug program, okay? And I'll get into just exactly what's involved. So this is, uh, this is my hello world program in assembly language. And in order to get a debug monitor to work, you have to be able to talk to the serial port and get it to send information back. So you're kind of got a chicken and egg problem here. You know, serial communication doesn't work but you don't have a debug monitor in place because serial communication doesn't work. So you, you kind of have to fly blind until you get, until you get the chip to send uh, ASCII characters back to the host. And that's what this does. It just sends a P character back to the host over and over and over again. And, uh, uh, okay, so this gives you some idea of what the code looks like. You have to set up a bunch of registers and then you, you stick the byte in the code here and it gets sent up to the host. And then you cross your fingers and run the host. And if you're really, really lucky, <laughs> when you start QCOM, you see a screen full of the P character and you go, yes! Run around screaming and waving your arms in the air because now you have communication with your hardware and everything becomes a, a whole lot easier because now you can write a routine to dump the registers out. Uh, you can change things in the processor and so on. So now you can write a serial monitor, and, and there are examples on the web that you can use to copy onto the processor writing one. And it resides in memory, so it takes up a little bit of memory, but not a lot. And, and you can put it in a section of memory that gets protected on this processor, okay, the bootloader section, so that even when you load a new program in, the monitor is still there, all right? That's very handy. So it'll, it'll survive uh, uh, resets and so on. Uh, dump memory locations, requires, requires the use of the serial port and so on and so forth. And you can protect it and it talks through a serial link. Now the alternatives, just to mention that there are alternatives to this that you might be interested in. The one that nearly everybody uses is ABR Studio, which is supported by Atmel to make these processor chips. It's a freebie, but it only runs under Windows. And the older versions ran under Wine, but the, you know, the, the impression I'm getting is that this is no longer possible. But if somebody is interested in pursuing this, um, it's a very nice programming environment, a GUI, and it shows you all the register settings and so on and so forth. It enables you to do stuff that's very, very easy. Um, it might be worthwhile to get that to work if you can get it to run under one. So that's one of the two possible ways to do this. And the other one is to write the program in C language under Linux using GCC ABR, which is a variant of GCC for this type of processor. And uh, there's a whole bunch of information available on that. I'm not familiar with GCC. I'm not familiar with C language programming, so I didn't pursue that. But again, a lot of people are using that particular approach. I'm in the process of writing all this up as a PDF document. And if anybody wants a copy with the references and the URLs and all that kind of thing, uh, just send me an email. 
and I'd be happy to send it along to you. Okay, any questions? Yes. I just wanted to comment on, on the C side. There's a tool set called DME that's used alongside it for, uh, for doing the push of data up, up, up to the, uh, the chips. I'm using keyboard controllers. Uh, okay. my, hey, my, I, my, I've got one of these programmable keyboards where yeah. I'm writing the, the code in C using GCC ADR. DFU is what uh, is, I guess, loosely the well, you need more than GCC. You, need, you get a hex file and you need to put yeah, it Yeah, people use it, uh, AVR dude, uh, for that. Okay, DFU is the one that seems to be popular. I, I'm seeing that it's popular. Okay. There's packages for that on Debian and so okay, forth. Okay, good, so. good to know. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Uh, various other things you built with it. Do you have any big programs with it? Um, well, all, all of our products uh, use Atmel microprocessors in them. So, so there's a signal generator, there's uh, uh, three different oscilloscopes, we have a curve tracer, um, we have a device called Signature Analyzer, so a whole bunch of instruments like that. And, and my, my business partner, James, uh, controls the LED candles in his backyard using <laughs> <laughs> his AVR processors in each one of his LED candles in his backyard so he can set the color and the intensity of the candles. Very important application. <laughs> Our channels are something basically around the first couple of generations of 3D printers. Yeah. Sorry. Is the app mill um, only on the Arduino or is there other uh, small? Uh, are there other boards? Yeah. As well? Yes, there are. Uh, you don't. Once, once you get launched, and of course the schematics for the Arduino are in, in the public domain, so you can take a look at the schematics, you can duplicate this on a proto board with a clock oscillator and a half a dozen other parts, you know? Um, but yeah, there are other boards. There are other boards as well. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. On to the next talk. Thank you.